try to bring in new employees over, over the last 10 years, where employees clearly expect companies to be able to do more than give them a paycheck and uh, potential for job security. You know, really wanting to see the involvement within the community. And uh, that's been a natural for us. And, but we, even though it's a natural for us, we've seen an, a very strong progression in terms of desire for volunteerism and desire for corporate advocacy. Uh, and so the way we would describe our um, community involvement is really around philanthropy. We have a $118 million foundation, gives away about six or $8 million a year on a normal basis, but also 50,000 hours of volunteer time. We only have 1,900 associates. Uh, and then corporate advocacy uh, across a range of issues, LGBT civil rights, um, in uh, early childhood development, safe streets, uh, immigrants, and, and the like. So, you know, we really define that broadly across those three spheres. Awesome. And I'm going to go a little off script early, keep you on your toes, but you mentioned specifically volunteer programs and volunteerism. And, you know, certainly it seems like this summer, getting a whole bunch of your employees and staff out in the community is not going to be possible. How are you thinking about, um, you know, still making that impact, still providing employees with a way to, to give back when, you know, large group gatherings might not be achievable. Yeah, and what we're really doing is looking for a, a number of volunteer um, opportunities that are virtual. And it's interesting, in the first six weeks, we, we all went off site the middle of March, with, like many companies. Uh, for the first, I'd say, month or so, I had zero interest in volunteerism because everybody's trying to figure it out. But like over the last couple, three weeks, we've gotten a lot more interest. Uh, people want to find ways to be able to volunteer. And so we're looking at ways to um, both volunteer to help our employees by hiring, instead of having summer tellers, which you know is not gonna really work, we're looking at hiring those college students to be mentors for the um, families or students within the families of Eastern Bay. So we're looking to do that. And we're also looking at ways that we can volunteer virtually through mentorship, through, uh, we're doing a lot of work right now with small businesses. Uh, we're the number one small business lender in New England, so it's a natural for us. And, um, and so we've got a lot of employees that are working directly with small businesses to help them with their um, turnaround. Excellent. And then coming back to one of your um, points at the beginning, talking about the different ways that Eastern Bank historically supported the community financially. How are you seeing those initiatives evolve or, or change, you know, since the middle of March when, when your whole team went remote and when obviously things have really started to change across your communities? Well, you know, uh, I, I think, as I was saying, our employees have a higher expectation for us and I think all companies to give back. And being a community bank really helps a lot because we have 115 locations and we have hundreds of people who are involved in volunteerism. So we're very connected with our communities. That helps us understand the pain points really early on. And so what we did, um, I think we got approval on March 19th um, to do $3 million worth of uh, COVID-19 relief for um, really centered around food security and centered around access to community health. And because we had a lot of relationships, because we've been involved in our communities and have funded many of these before, we had a good sense of where to go and how to do that. Uh, we've also been helping others who maybe didn't have that strong a network to begin with by identifying community foundations. Uh, and we've also given to those. And that's a great way, to, it's a great halfway to go uh, if you're not really sure where where the money can be for its best advantage by being able to leverage the community foundations that are very steeped in the communities and usually regional in nature. Um, donations to those kinds of organizations can get money deployed quickly to where it's most needed. Awesome. And then one last question for you actually from the audience before we bring Jim and Sarah into the conversation. Um, but how do you think about what success looks like across some of those newer initiatives or some of those organizations that you're choosing to to support, um, you know, if, if that is something that you're considering at this point as part of these grants and as part of getting this capital into the community? Yeah, so that's always the bugaboo for philanthropy. 
you know, how do you measure success? And, and how do you know you've moved the needle, as my board regularly asks me. Um, in this case, it's really, um, we're, the initial me metrics we're using is how fast can this money be deployed closest in the communities to where vulnerable populations are getting benefit. Um, I think in a broader sense, we also want to know that this money is actually going where they are using it as intended. You know, it's one thing for a company to want to be philanthropic and to give away big money. And, you know, in addition to the three million we did in March, we've since, um, since then, just a few weeks ago, approved another $5 million. So if you're going to spend $8 million, you damn well better know that it's going where you want it to go. Uh, and, and for that, there's a, there are two forces there that are diametrically opposed. On the one hand, you want to get this money out and into circulation where it's really helping uh, and having the highest impact. On the other hand, you want to know that you've got some kind of reporting so that you know that um, where the money went. And so what we've tried to do is, is strike a balance point. And there's no perfect balance point. But I think you do have to take those two forces into, into control or into consideration, I should say, even though you don't really have control. And, um, and optimize to getting the money out as opposed to, um, what, what's, the, what's the phrase? Uh, perfection is the enemy of the good. Uh, so getting the yep. list is going to make you be too late to the party. Awesome. No, I, I appreciate that. Jim, as, as, as I said, want to want to turn to you here. I know America's Charities has a long history in powering workplace giving programs at some of the largest employers in the country, working with financial institutions like Nancy's, but all sorts of different industries. Um, with that, I've personally been astonished by what you've shared with me about the growth of employee assistance funds. I know you mentioned those at, at a high level as part of your, your introduction before. So as a starting point, can you share with the audience who might not be familiar with it, what, what an employee assistance fund is, how it works, and, and why you're seeing so much interest and adoption of those over the last four to eight weeks. Yeah, I'm happy to, Gideon. So the way that I like to think about employee assistance funds, um, particularly in talking to companies about them, is that it is um, a perfect vehicle for an organization to turn their own philanthropy um, inwards and help their own employees out that are experiencing um, difficult situations, financial hardships that are the result of um, an emergency situation. Um, and that could be anywhere from a, a medical or health emergency and they don't have funds to pay the deductibles or doctor visits or hospital bills or whatever that may be to situations like a qualified disaster or something that's been presidentially declared. Now, in the past, we historically just thought of those as the large hurricanes or an earthquake or a big flood, um, but we are all now living uh, a presidentially declared disaster, and that is COVID-19. Uh, and so we, we actually launched this service last year, um, and we're able to onboard um, a few clients rather quickly because there is an incredible interest um, in the employer sector um, for these types of programs. And we're uniquely positioned to be able to offer that service to companies because we can bring all of the benefits a 501c3 organization can to the space that a company can't bring themselves just because of the tax structure and the different requirements and obligations required to actually successfully execute uh, a program. Um, but because of COVID-19 and it is a qualified disaster, we are seeing um, what I would call rapid adoption um, and a huge surge of interest in um, companies wanting to be able to offer a level of assistance to their employees that have been impacted um, by this particular disaster. So that's situations where either the employee or someone in their household may have actually contracted coronavirus, um, or uh, more commonly, um, someone's been financially impacted as a result um, of the economic uh, shutdown, uh, people being furloughed, having their salaries reduced, having their hours reduced, um, or outright terminated because the job's just no longer there. Um, this is a program that companies can establish with, in partnership with us or other organizations to allow charitable contributions to be funneled to their employees in need. As long as they meet certain requirements and certain criteria, they can receive a tax-free financial assistance grant from 
uh, from the uh, America's Charities. Um, the other aspect to these programs that we're also positioned to be able to provide for a company is that we're finding that companies want to leverage the goodwill of their own employee base as well not just the company themselves and providing a contribution or grant uh, into the program, but allowing those employees who um, are still employed and are in a position to be able to support their coworkers that may be in need as well. Uh, we can tie in an employee giving solution um, right into the employee assistance fund as well, so that the company their and their employees are helping their fellow coworkers out. Awesome. and. Uh, another question coming in from, from the audience, they're asking, can you share examples, if, if you have any of the sizes or the types of companies that you're seeing, if it is, you know, that, that way at all, or if you're sort of seeing it across the board where a program like this makes sense, or do you sort of, is there a minimum size of, of the company that, that you're seeing this be successful with, just to help folks in, in the audience understand if they might be a good fit? Yeah, great question. So we're, um, in terms of interest, we're basically seeing interest from organizations of all sizes. Um, and that's also reflected in our client base, where we have some employers that are as small as just a few hundred employees, um, and some that are large, as large as, you know, several thousand employees with franchise locations across the country, um, including internationally as well. Um, and so it really does, the interest level spans the, the spectrum of, of industry, of business. Um, where we're seeing this more, most successful, generally because of the administrative aspects and fees associated with getting a program established, um, sometimes organizations that are smaller, um, let's say, you know, three, under 500 employees is probably a good threshold. Um, uh, they may find that they could execute something specifically for their employees directly themselves um, under the IRS guidelines um, with uh, qualified disasters, employers can actually provide a tax-free grant um, disaster relief assistance to their employees, um, but they still actually have to meet some requirements or some documentation requirements. There's some things that you have to do in terms of how you actually manage the program. Um, and unfortunately, in that kind of a scenario, any contributions that are made into the fund are not tax deductible because they have to be made to a 501c3 organization. Um, but, um, you know, for larger organizations, particularly those that may be a little bit more uh, complex, um, multiple locations and things of that nature, you know, outsourcing it has been, I think, um, a lot easier for them to do. They can get the program established rather quickly um, and able to get assistance out to their employees in need. Excellent. And yeah, Nancy and Sarah, please, please jump in with, uh, with no, well, we added color and, and commentary if you have it. Well, the other, you know, as Jim was talking, it made me think, you know, uh, the, the sense of urgency since March 19th is off the charts across every aspect. And one of the ways that we can really get to um, doing things uh, in an expedited way is the technology. And, I, I you know, it's really important to, to note that, you know, in Massachusetts, uh, Pink Lou was great in helping us set up the Mass COVID-19 um, fund that had never existed before and you know where you might expect something like standing up a fund would take I don't know six months or so what, what do we do it in six days four days you know it yeah. uh, and and the reason why we were able to do that was one because of your technology but two also because of the way you guys work and the partnership that we had with all the players and you know I think it's, it's important to note that that technology is a place where now uh, we can accommodate that increased sense of urgency in new ways that we would definitely not have been able to do before. 100% and, and I've had some questions around implementation teed up for later, but let, let's dive right into it. Jim, let's talk about, you know, a company loves what they're hearing. They want to get a program like this going. They, they reach out to, to folks at America's Charities. What are you setting in terms of expectations for how long they can get a program live and start making an impact across their employees? Yeah, some of that depends on what the objectives are of the client. You know, what is it that they want to accomplish with their fund? Um, if they're looking to really just get an immediate assistance program set up and in place to get dollars out to their employees as quickly as possible, we can generally get a program set up within a couple of weeks 
Um, some of that's dependent upon how long it takes us to work through the policy and eligibility requirement discussions with them. Um, but once we've got that established, um, it, it's a matter of a couple of days of getting the, uh, the online application site built out and uh, ready for them to go. So really there is, um, you know, once we have an agreement, um, there's really kind of three big buckets that we need to get accomplished. One is get the policy framework set up and established. So that includes the eligibility criteria, um, uh, employee roster, and get the, and then we can build out the application site. Uh, which is the second piece and making sure that that technology solution is there and ready to roll. Uh, and then the third element is funding, um, making sure that the company's provided enough funding to be able to provide grants to their employees. Once those three boxes are checked, uh, we can rock and roll. Fantastic. And, and Sarah, by no means did I, did I expect to take so long to, to bring you into the, into the conversation. Um, my, my apologies there, but you know, so you're obviously focused on, on engaging corporate partners, you know, would love to hear what you're seeing with your partners generally, and then specific to, to workplace giving programs, maybe that are not focused on employee assistance funds, but more focused on getting capital and getting employees supporting organizations, probably locally, um, you know, what, what, what you're seeing out there and how COVID has changed that over the last few months. Sure. Thanks, Gideon. Well, we're seeing companies come to us as their trusted partner with a desire to give back, whether it's financial or engagement opportunities. And I think Nancy alluded to this as well. And given the impact of charities, many corporations are running special campaigns that provide employees an opportunity to make a one-time gift to COVID response, like through our COVID Resiliency Fund. We're seeing this not only with corporations, but in various levels of the public sector campaigns, including the federal government. Um, another example is um, one of our Midwest state government partners is doing a month-long special solicitation for COVID-19 relief, and donors can make a one-time gift along with payroll deduction for a period of time. And the state is still planning to hold a fall campaign. Uh, another large medical group that we work with is running a mini spring campaign to support the increased need among nonprofits. And that's significant because in early March, we surveyed our nonprofit partners and to really identify the impact that coronavirus was having on their ability to fulfill their missions. And we found that 73% had already canceled a fundraising event. And as you've heard, this these types of cancellations are tremendous when it comes to nonprofits. So in total, we found that just between March, April, and May alone, $644 million was the cumulative financial loss among those organizations that had responded. Um, in addition, um, fall campaigns are right now in the initial planning stages. And so those that have never run an online giving campaign are making that shift. Um, and capitalizing on our team's expertise to ex assist in that rollout. And there's also a desire to engage employees virtually, and I think Nancy spoke to this. So we're creating customized experiences for employees that provide an opportunity to give back um, and volunteer what we call on the spot. So, and obviously, you know, we know mental health and well being is a concern uh, among employers. And so, they see volunteering as an outlet for employees to participate individually and collectively, even via Zoom. Um, and so one example is we're working with a equipment company with over 80 locations around the country to build out a four month virtual volunteer initiative that includes virtual walks and mental health support and gratitude, outreach and more. So, and lastly, we've got some really great resources that we are sharing as we reach out to our partners on an individual basis. Awesome. Um, and Tara, let me follow up with that. And Jim would love your thoughts on this as well. But how are you seeing the, the specific organizations that employees are choosing to support changing, um, if at all? Are they, are they directing their dollars towards different organizations during these one-time um, opportunities to contribute um, or maybe even changing their, their allocations if that's something that their program supports? Sure. So we are seeing a, um, a real interest in mental health, both in the short term and long term. And that's been something that seems to be resonating with a lot of our companies. Um, as it pertains to employee giving, I think employees are looking to maximize the impact of their gift. And so we're working with companies around cause, causes, both customized causes with, the, with charities of their choice and also our own causes that address um, mental health and well-being. 
Yeah, and we're we're seeing um, what we're seeing in the employee giving campaigns that we're managing for you know for our corporate clients. Um, what what we're seeing is a is a, a lot of interest in. Uh, matching campaigns. And so we've got um, a handful of clients that have run special, um, essentially COVID-19 matching gift campaigns. And they are all, you know, they're setting a goal and every single one of them are, you know, are, is hitting that goal uh, and probably going, going over that. Um, you know, and those are focusing on organizations that are providing relief in the communities um, for people that are being impacted. So we're seeing a great deal of interest in our, um, you know, in our feeding partners uh, and, you know, our members that are, are part of that and organizations that, you know, have this niche focus into, um, you know, into disease and public health, um, where there in the past, public health wasn't something that had a lot of visibility or interest in. And that's kind of risen to the top now um, as well. So we're seeing people wanting to find those types of organizations to support as well. And then, and Nancy, to, to pull you in, I know we talked a lot about the foundation and the corporate giving that Eastern Bank does, but you obviously have a fantastic matching program as, as well. Um, to the extent that you have seen data, has, has you, have you seen an uptick in employees using that? And have you seen them changing the organizations that they're supporting? Yeah, so we have seen an uptick in, in matching gifts. Uh, it's interesting, we've had more people participate, but at lower dollar amounts. Um, so I, what I attribute that to is that we just have a much broader population of employees who are deciding to, to give. And you know, it really doesn't matter whether it's a large amount or a small amount. It's the participation that you want in a matching gift program and allowing people to feel that sense of contributing. And um, the, the other piece that we've uh, noticed, and it's, it's early to tell, frankly, but um, it seems where most philanthropy uh, in general will go to hospitals, for us, hospitals, universities, and arts and cultural organizations, what we're seeing is a definite swing, at least in the early stages, because it's only the beginning of May, so we only have about a month's worth of data. But, uh, you know, it, it appears to be a strong swing to more human service, you know, around supporting immigrants, elders, people with disabilities, um, uh, mental health, you know, definitely those types of, um, uh, of organizations are getting much more of the match at this time. Make, make, make sense. Um, you know, and then I'll, I'll start with my thoughts on the next question and then open it up to Sarah and Jim given that we all work with different software platforms to support this, but we, we chatted a little bit about what's involved in getting an employee assistance fund live. You know, similarly, as we've been rolling out new workplace giving programs, you know, we've really been focusing on applying resources to organizations that are looking to create and spin up new programs and trying to shorten the, the timeline. So we're, before this, we would often set expectations six to eight weeks to get a program live. You know, now we're, we're setting expectations with, with four weeks and trying to, trying to beat that wherever we can. Um, and also, you know, just putting as many resources towards it as possible, but we'd love to get a sense, you know, from the other platforms that you work with, Sarah, you know, are, are you seeing folks getting programs live more quickly than they were before? And what are you setting in terms of expectations for, for a new program to, to get live? Sure. So obviously we're seeing and, and feeling the immediacy of wanting to get these programs up. and. You know, typically, depending on the complexity of the program, we can get that up within a day or two. Nice. Yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing, particularly as it relates to our employee assistance funds, we've got a lot of organizations that um, really are interested in tying uh, a giving component directly, directly to that. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, we've got a platform we can get up within a couple of days. Um, it's real basic, kind of straightforward, um, easy to engage, not a lot of bells and whistles, um, uh, you know, not a rich feature set, but it meets the need, um, you know, that urgent need, if you will. Um, but then on the outside, you know, we do have organizations that are really looking beyond just this immediacy and this urgent need and uh, want to have a platform in place that is there for the long haul and one that they can actually grow uh, and expand into other areas. And so um, with those with those solutions, um, uh, I know if I have team members that are on this call, they're going to kill me, but they know I've done this to them. Um, so, you know, we've, we've 
um, we can work to get something up within three weeks. Um, that's taking a lot of effort though, and a lot of work on the part of the client as well, because there is you know, client lift that's involved in getting these kinds of things uh, set up. Uh, and that's if it's fairly, fairly straightforward, right? If they're just looking for a pure giving solution with the, not a lot of complexity to it. But if they want to start to fold in, you know, the volunteer management aspects of the platform, well, that's another iteration and another layer of complexity. Or if they want to actually tie in and build out their grants management program on top of that, you know, we've got solutions that will do all three of those incredibly well. Um, and so each one of them have a different set of requirements. And so it really does depend on what they what they want to kind of get accomplished and kind of what their short-term objectives are and what their longer-term objectives are. So we've got a variety of different ways that we can work with a work with an organization. We can start with something really simple and quick to meet that urgent need, but then work towards the longer, you know, uh, the longer need on the on the back end and get that built out over, you know, our typical, you know, stand-up time is, you know, anywhere between six and 10 weeks, depending upon the solution. Yeah, de de definitely, and and you know, uh, I, I chose to shade my range on the on the side that the team wouldn't be angry with me. Um, so I appreciate you going going on the on the other approach. Um, we do have a, a question cu coming in, um, and I'll I'll actually field it. But it was asking, you know, in in our case, the four weeks does that include all KYC, know know your client, and all of the other diligence? And and the answer is yeah, you know, definitely that's going to include getting through any technical vendor compliance that, that's required. It's also gonna include a lot of the configurations that Jim identified. So in our case, a lot of times an organization, the employer might wanna choose which charities are eligible and which ones are not eligible to receive contributions, get integrated into payroll, you know, a fully, a fully baked program um, for, for, for sure. Um, to answer that, that question, I think coming back to implementation, you know, we've talked a good deal about uh, employee assistance funds, and we've talked about workplace giving and opportunities for matching. Nancy, you, you briefly mentioned standing up a, a, a new fund, but oftentimes, you know, the easiest way for an employer to, to give back is to say, hey, we, we really want to put our resources and we want to put our infrastructure towards supporting one, one or two specific causes. And in some ways, you know, that, that's what we did together in terms of rallying a lot of your vendors, customers, employees, the community at large around a COVID fund and then allowing you know folks to choose how that gets distributed you know and as you mentioned we were able to get that live really quickly you know i think the it, we reduced choice you know obviously there was only one or one or two places where people could give but got a program live re really quickly i think one of the things i was hoping you could spend a few minutes talking about is you know obviously we all work at organizations that have a lot of uh core competencies have a lot of expertise beyond just being able to give resources and so you know i think helping people understand what are the ways that they can put their expertise and their existing infrastructure in place to support these things beyond money would, would be helpful and would love if you can share some of the ways that, that eastern bank has made financial services available and some of the other ways that you all have have helped support some of these causes just to get folks thinking about other ways that they can bring resources to bear Sure, uh, that's a lot of stuff to unpack there, but I'll do my best. Uh, and I think it's yeah. a good of Jim's uh, comment um, around the length of time it takes to end some of these things up. And where do you start? Do you start small and grow, or do you try and build out to uh, a, a relatively bigger platform and, and, and get it all done before you launch? And I, I think we're kind of on the, uh, let's build something and let it grow end of the scale. Uh, and that's worked well for us. Uh, the reason we were able to stand up the Massachusetts Fund very quickly was because we had already done a lot of work in setting up a, another program called Grants for Good, uh, also on the Pinkaloo platform. Um, and having gone through all of that and knowing where that was, that made the Massachusetts COVID-19 Fund that much easier to do. And then when we turned around and did the same thing for a New Hampshire Fund in Portsmouth, it was even easier. So, you know, I, I think that th there's real scalability here and that doesn't necessarily have to come in all the same flavors. And I think that, um, you know, as Jim was saying, a, a company or an organization can start with something and then build out off of that um, and build whatever you feel is, is the most appropriate for you at the time and then um, continue to expand it. Cause you know, now that we've done this, you know, you do it once you're a rookie you do it twice, you're a veteran. So <laughs> we'll be doing more of these. And, and I think that the world has changed. 
uh, I, I think that the expectation of doing th these types of things, uh, having online donations, multi-channel donations, being able to take ACH and things like that, all of that, it, it, the expectations are higher now and the time to be able to, the agility to be able to address community needs, whether those be local community needs or more regional or national or global, are really gonna drive um, expectations. And, um, and I think the technology and the, the teaming, like what you do with America's Charities and so on, is uh, gonna, gonna allow us to respond as a, as a company, as a bank, as an organization, or as a region. Yeah. Um, and Dancy, that's a that's an that's an excellent point. Um, just in terms of the, uh, I don't know if I would call it uh, shifting expectations, growing expectations is I think what you what you said, and that's something that we are definitely seeing and experiencing from a variety of different levels from um, from donors. Um, you know, and one trend that we've been seeing over the time is you know the 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 desire to have more choice, um, and so that's always that's that's been a trend that's been out there. But now what we're seeing along with that choice is, well, I'd like to have a little bit more information about these particular charities. Uh, and then what we're seeing with response to like disasters is it's not so much about having a lot of choice. I want to know that the organizations that I'm going to be supporting are actually doing good on the ground and who are they and what are they doing? Um, and, you know, because of the work that we also do on the charity side is, you know, we're able to stand up disaster relief funds fairly quickly. And we got one set up with COVID-19, limited choice, two organizations, one focusing on public health, one focusing on feeding. Um, but those are two big things and areas of interest. And so being able to kind of move rapidly with that and then having the technology solutions already in place um, allows those funds to get rapidly adopted. And so we were able to get that launched with our 60 you know, clients, those that wanted to be able to offer that. Um, they didn't have to figure out what do I need to do or do I have to do something? It was kind of there ready for them to, um, ready for them to adopt uh, and move forward. Um, which is, you know, a last point that I wanted to make kind of off of your comments, Nancy, is that in order for all of this to happen, in order for you guys to do what you were able to do, for what Gideon's able to do, what he's able to do, Sarah, ourselves, um, what we're finding is the power of partnerships. Um, and uh, things are moving just so fast uh, that incompetencies are emerging so quickly in so many different areas for one organization to be able to say they got it all um, is difficult. But can one organization say, I can bring it all together? That is what we're about. Uh, and that's what you know, Gideon's doing with us and with you guys. And uh, you know, we're replicating that in, in other areas as well. It just allows everybody to benefit from kind of best in class in specific areas and just have you know, fantastic solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't I think agree. I think Jim brings up a good point with kind of institutional knowledge and how um, partners, we're working with partners around really furthering the work that they want to do to support communities. One in particular is a manufacturing company that has a, a national footprint across the country and they came to us and said, you know, we want to make um, investments around mental health as it relates to COVID. And so because we have those relationships um, on the ground and they've been vetted, we were able to move very quickly to get those gifts um, to impact every community where their employees live and work. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Sarah. And I think that that desire for, for um, broadcast but narrow focus on a specific topic is, is what we're gonna see a lot of. And, and I kind of look at it as kind of the Amazon effect as it relates to philanthropy. You know, people want what they want, they want that item and they want it as quickly as possible. And I think the next piece we're gonna see is the Yelp effect, where people are gonna, following on Jim's comment just a minute ago, people wanna know, they want some feedback on where did that money go? the organizations are going to have to find ways to be able to connect back to the donor population to say and this, you know we sent this out to here and here's a story that happened here and and you know the equivalent kind of the equivalent of reviews but for but for from the user end of the philanthropy or the the uh, recipient end of the philanthropy 
Yeah, well, I love that the the Yelp uh, the Yelp for philanthropy. That's that's uh, definitely where 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 things are are headed. Um, so Daniel, definitely want to want to. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. Okay. Let's we'll, we'll take that as the next step on on our end. Um, so I want I want to wrap in in five minutes or so. We have a couple of questions, but sort of the last question I wanted to tee up for Sarah was. What were you hoping that we discussed or that I asked today that, that we didn't get to or to put on my, my cable news anchor hat? We'll give you the last word. But uh, yeah, what, what were you hoping that we touched on today that, that we didn't and that you think the folks in the audience are, would be interested to hear about? Sure. Thanks, Gideon. Well, it's not so much really a question, but something to build off as it relates to COVID and how it's brought health to the forefront, including really its inequities. Um, and as you know, we've been working in health for over 65 years, so we're in a perfect position to support our partners. Health is something that really matters to everybody, and we've learned through COVID that it doesn't discriminate. Um, and so that's why we're seeing really an uptick in interest by corporations to work with us. Awesome. I appreciate that. Let me, let me pull in one of the questions. This one's for Nancy, and please... There are others uh, definitely submit them now. But Nancy's question is around how should a, a for-profit company be thinking about using corporate bu budgets or corporate donations as matching funds versus making direct uh, donations on, on, on their own out into the community? Uh, well, at Easter, we do both. When there are times when it makes sense to make donations directly from the company. For example, if uh, you have a little league that you want to give to, they're not going to be a 501c3, uh, and so um, it's easier, faster, more direct, and smaller dollars, so simple to do through the company. Uh, then there are times like a, you have, uh, not to get too technical into the tax code here, because I'll, I'll put everybody to sleep, but there are times when a company wants to give directly, um, and there are other times when it makes more sense to have that money uh, from a financial standpoint, from a taxation standpoint, for the company to create a foundation and then give from the foundation. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what we started this about 26 years ago. Uh, and that's how it's grown to 118 million. You know, it didn't start out that much. It's, you know, it was pretty much peanuts in the beginning. But, you know, the, the whole compounding effect <laughs> um, really gets you to a place where you do have money and resources to be able to do it. And then it's not a drain on corporate earnings at a time when you're have a dip, having a financial difficulty for every company. Uh, and you can still make those kinds of donations and, and create that kind of community support that your uh, employees and your customers are looking for you to do. So, uh, you know, I, I think I would definitely recommend people uh, getting involved in some way to be able to do this, whether they do this through America's Charities or they do this through their own foundation, being able to make these funds um, available on a tax preferred basis is definitely the way to go. I'm sure you don't want me to go deep into that, so I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Give them enough to, to want to reach out to more. Um, awesome. Well, I think with that, we will we'll wrap things up here. Can't thank you enough for for sharing your time and, and your expertise with with the audience and with all of us today. Just in the nick of time, one last question comes in. Um, we touched on this a touch earlier, but I think would would be interested, Sarah. Maybe we'll we'll point this one towards you. Question around: um, Can you share how technology solutions are making programs easier to administer than they were five years ago or even fifteen years ago in terms of? organizations getting new programs live, making it easy for them to administer. You know, obviously there's gonna be some upfront work to figure the program out, but after that, maybe a little bit less of the ongoing um, administrative work. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's funny because we've been working with companies who have been, uh, you know, holding fast to paper. <laughs> believe it or not, um, for a long time. And when we're able to, to show them kind of the donor experience and how easy it is to generate reports on the back end, they realize that sitting and counting pledge cards is probably not the best use of their time. And so, um, so our solution um, is fairly robust as far as providing uh, ease of use and um, the ability to get it up and running quickly. Yeah, getting we've we've seen kind of um, the role of technology really evolve, you know, from kind of what Sarah 
mentioned. Um, in fact, we had our own kind of homegrown platform that we had. Um, and, you know, it got outpaced by the market, you know, just in terms of the rapid advance of technology solutions uh, in this space and really kind of just different types of programs that that are that are out there and for you know different kinds of purposes but they're facilitating all kinds of things now and making the process for supporting your charity incredibly easy um, you know from having um, all of the charities you know the entire irs database at your fingertips and being able to just type in a few letters and find find your organization and say i'm going to donate to that one um, and we're starting to see, you know, in, you know, what, what you guys have brought to the marketplace in terms of your platform and what it offers is distinct in the space and giving more choice uh, to individuals in terms of how they manage their own, their own philanthropy. Um, and then just the giving options, right, that are available to somebody on a wide variety of platforms. I can do it through payroll deduction over recurring uh, one time I can do credit card one time or recurring I can do PayPal I can do I can donate my PTO I can donate stock um, just you know basically anything that you have there is a platform that will convert that to dollars for you and allow you to actually donate it to charity and, and get you a tax receipt in the process and get you a tax uh, receipt. Uh, 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 automated as, as, as well um, we there, there's another question came in. We'll we'll put up a, a card at the end with contact information for all of us. But um, there, there's a question around volunteer on the spot opportunities um, that I think Sarah you were mentioning some of those before as well. So to that uh, attendee, I'd, I'd suggest maybe reach out to, to Sarah. I don't Jim. I don't know if, if America's Charities has volunteer focused programs right now and volunteer on the spot ones as, as well. Um, but reach out to, to one of them and I'm sure they can they can help uh, figure out what the options look like for your organization. Let me I'll, I'll go ahead and, and share that. Um, if there are other questions we can or share the, the contact information but if there are other questions I'm sure I can stay on for a few more minutes. Hopefully the other panelists can as well. Um, and then we will we'll share out the the recording as well if folks want to refer back to to any of this as, as well. I was a little delinquent. I only got the recording about two, three minutes in, so you might have missed my uh, my, my intro. But uh, the, the rest of uh, all of the good content will be available as, as well. So let me share share that contact card um, and then definitely be online to uh, take a few more questions as well. And we can get we can get Jim's. Uh, Metallica going is on, on softer music this time while we while we see if there are some other questions that come in. You know, I didn't think you were actually going to play that. <laughs> Why not? It's good. <laughs> That's working. Now I just need to get music to play. And with that, folks certainly can can um, head out, um, or if there are, hope we get some more questions. Um, a question, maybe we'll start. We'll start with Sarah uh, here. But how can charities connect with corporations during this this time? Well, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, in, in our role, um, we work with charities to connect them with corporations so um you know i mean i think from a from a charity perspective it's as easy as really kind of picking up the phone and building relationships yeah i, I think that any company that's looking to connect with it with a nonprofit or group of nonprofits, it's so much easier now than it used to be you know to to i think jim's point earlier about having all of this at our fingertips, GuideStar, the IRS, all this, it's just so much easier than it used to be in the old days. So, you know, any company, I think the hard part is really getting consensus around what do you want to fund? Um, because if you have any number of employees, they're going to have any number of items that they'd like to see supported. 
And uh, so, you know, the hard work is in coming up with the consensus so that people will get uh, and making sure that that is focused on things that are significant, that are hitting significant needs. And, and I think um, I'm going to take a guess, but um, the person that may have asked this question may be a charity themselves. And this is a question that we actually get um, quite a bit. Um, from charities as well as the nonprofits that are members of America's Charities, and that is, how can I increase my visibility in front of companies? Um, how do I get my my name, my mission out there in front of them and their employees? And um, you know, quite frankly, um, that is a difficult task, uh, just because there is just just a large number of organizations. Uh, we're seeing just in terms of the demographic trends and. Um, you know, younger donors maybe not be so attached to institutions per se as they are to more causes. Um, and they may have their own favorite little charity that they like to support. Uh, and then companies themselves, um, quite frankly, get overwhelmed. And, and Nancy, I know that probably happens to you quite a bit. And, you know, how do you kind of sort through that? And some charities have very tight gates um, that a uh, charity has to be able to get through before they'll even kind of talk to them. Um, some of it is relationship based and, you know, kind of who you know and where you run into them and what kind of relationship you can establish to get a little visibility. So it's, you know, nothing new, nothing new there. Um, but one of the, uh, the, the, the advice and work that we provide on behalf of, you know, our charities is one is to have great content, have a great story to tell but make sure you've got data behind your story. So it's gotta be that right combination. Um, and then um, one thing that I know a lot of companies are looking for, particularly for their workplace giving programs um, and their communication is content. And so if you can provide you know, great content for them that is visually appealing, that has got great story um, with it, that can go a long way in helping you get your visibility. Um, and, and then, you know, just making sure that you're a part of workplace giving campaigns, that you've got an ability or an opportunity to get featured, um, you know, for, uh, for, specific, uh, for specific campaigns and things of that nature. Um, again, it's, it can be difficult, though, for a nonprofit to, you can't just knock on a door. Um, you know, the cold calling, won't, it'll be just a lot of wasted time. Uh, and so it's just leveraging uh, contacts that you have relationships that you have, partnerships that you have. Um, I mean, we work on behalf of our members to get them visibility in the campaigns that we're managing. Um, and there's just, you know, other things that you can do with respect to that. But it's, you know, it's, to be blunt, it's very difficult. <laughs> well, just to piggyback on what Jim said as well, I mean, that's, that's the value of working with a federation is the ability to be positioned within workplace giving campaigns across the country and having that federation working on your behalf um, in partnership to, to position your volunteer opportunities, to position special um, grant opportunities, um, and, and that's how we work with our uh, charity partners. Yeah, and I would just echo your, your comments about trying to do this on a, a broadcast getting map blast out to companies trying to get uh, your foot in the door is not a, not a success strategy at all. Um, it, it, uh, it's really just a waste of time. It, the world has moved from the broadcast, put as many uh, hooks in the ocean as you can to try and catch a fish, to really, you need to be more strategic and need to be able to network to be able to do that. And I, and I agree with Sarah that working through federations puts you in a better position. Um, it increases your credibility. It increases the uh, veritas of what you're saying. Um, and, um, and the visibility that you'll have with companies, especially companies of a good size, uh, that just, we can't afford to have everybody come in and meet with us, even though that we might like to, but there's so much else that has to happen that it's really not, not a success strategy. And, um, and please don't send those five page emails, <laughs> just as a personal request. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> they don't get read, so don't give me five pages. Just tell me, as, as Jim was saying, what's the main focus of what you're doing? And I'll look at that and see whether that's in line with my main focus of giving. And then we can do some research. 
You know, one last point uh, and another um, piece of counsel that we provide to, to our members is, um, you know, know who your donors are um, and um, see if you can, you know, with your donor population, identify those that are working for companies. And if you've got kind of a, a group of them, you know, maybe you have half a dozen folks that work for an organization, um, enlist, maybe even if it's just even one donor, but they're strategically positioned in the company, um, work with that individual to see if they can promote your cause and uh, perhaps bring you a little visibility in the workplace giving campaign. Um, you know, just through the efforts that may be taking place within the, the corporation themselves, particularly if they've got kind of a, um, you know, historically or typically it's kind of the fall campaign when a lot of organizations run uh, giving campaigns, but more and more they're evergreen, they run year round. Um, but sometimes there's events or opportunities to promote a charity. And if you can leverage your own supporters that are already in that company, uh, that's another way that you can use, um, you know, to look at to help increase your visibility within a within a company and just to piggyback yeah. on what jim said you know employee resource groups are another opportunity to get in within a corporation particularly those who have an area of focus that aligns with the work that you do they can really champion um, your cause within an organization and i was even going to jump in you know in, in our platform specifically there's a space for the company to be able to choose organizations that they want to promote. And I know that's a feature of, of many of the causes, but, you know, our more active companies are updating those on a monthly basis, you know, in pre COVID, they would highlight, you know, Earth Day, and then later in the year, you know, other holidays and other causes that align with various types of giving. Obviously, right now, we're seeing a lot of activity focused on all of the causes that we've been talking about here, whether that's hunger related organizations, mental health, physical health, elderly services, all of these kinds of things. But, you know, I think there is an opportunity more and more for organizations to leverage the channels that Sarah and Jim highlighted, whether it's a, an affinity group, a diversity and inclusion group or others to find some internal champions to get them some space. And, you know, we're seeing companies give those internal leaders three or five minutes at an all hands meeting to share why was this organization highlighted for the next quarter for the next month and talk about why the work that that organization does is aligned with the company and is aligned with the culture and, and all of that. So um, a, a few a few pieces there is, as well. I would just add also um, don't overlook opportunities for volunteering. If you have volunteering opportunities and you can get employees who want to volunteer. It's another piece just like the other two that were described that can give you uh, that networked foot in the door. All right, I think we've, uh, we've exhausted the questions that were, were coming in through the various channels, the chat and the, and the Q&A. So um, if we missed any questions, you have our contact information, Re reach out um, and, and, and we'll, we'll happily respond. We'll also be sharing the, the video recording um, and you can pass any, any questions back to us. I guess one, one last question um, and we will target it for Nancy, but there's a question coming in around um, how are you thinking about and handling press or publicity around the work that you're doing during this time? And is it different than it, it might have been before in terms of how you're talking about it and messaging it? Yeah, um, this is an internal struggle. <laughs> uh, what, what I'm actually seeing is a lot more interest in uh, press on social media and in local, uh, you know, like Patch or, or local papers. Um, as opposed to the Globe, which is the, the regional paper here in, in my area, um, where, you know, they're more interested in the local on the ground impact of the donation dollars and less interested in large amounts being announced uh, because the, it's hard to ground those large amounts in real stories. So um, in terms of our press, we typically have not in the past talked a lot about um, or like had an individual who's benefiting by it be interviewed as part of it, uh, but that is now really necessary. And I think it replaces, in the past we used to have pictures. <laughs> and now because we're all working from home, there's no more pictures. So I, I think we're trying to get now some pros in there that really describe the impact and that makes it more interesting. 
gets more airtime in, in the in the press more generally on TV and, and on um, and in the more regional larger scale papers. Um, and then you know it's always been something that's been very valuable in uh, letters um, and newsletters within the organizations to be able to use and that you know reaches out to their own donor base and reinforces the fact that others are giving. Perfect. Thank you. Well, Jim, Nancy, Sarah, thanks all of you so, so much. Appreciate all of you making the time again. Thanks to everyone who, who joined. We'll, we'll wrap it up there. Reach out to us with, with questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Bye-bye.